This video will concern itself with types of leadership. It will, however, look at the interface between entrepreneurship and leadership also. So we will look at leadership from various perspectives, but bearing in mind that leadership is uh, an important ingredient in entrepreneurship. Early theories uh, of entrepreneurship were provided by economists, the most famous being Schumpeter in his Theory of Economic Development in 1934. Uh, Schumpeter, the great Austrian economist, uh, he was occupied uh, with concepts like innovation and the importance of innovation uh, in industrial development, in business development. Um, but also the whole role of entrepreneurship was starting to emerge as a topic. Uh, orthodox economics, neoclassical economics, does not have a lot to say about entrepreneurship. So the sort of economics, the types of economics that are that is studied, I should say, at many colleges and universities around the world, does not play up the importance of entrepreneurship. If anything, it plays it down. And there were a group of economists in Austria in the 1870s, in the 80s and so on, who now have become known as the Austrian economists. Uh, they emphasized the importance of entrepreneurship and the importance of entrepreneurship in business development and business management. And Schumpeter, uh, whilst not directly influenced or, or related to those economists, was also uh, interested in the role of entrepreneurship in business management and business development. So Schumpeter placed an emphasis on these, these con uh, concepts and this brought them into the light. Uh, Schumpeter was famous for many contributions within economics. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, possibly his emphasis on the importance of innovation was, uh, was a new departure in the study of economics. But the fact that he emphasized entrepreneurship brought in leadership as well, leadership being an important component of entrepreneurship. His focus was on innovation, as I said, as a stimulus for what he called creative destruction, which destroyed economic equilibrium. See, orthodox economics, neoclassical economics, uh, places a lot of emphasis on equilibrium, on the attainment of an equilibrium, and on the uh, running of the economy in a manner which is conducive to the attainment of equilibria throughout the market system. But Schumpeter considered innovation to be a destructive force in the context of equilibrium. He saw innovation as one that was going to, in a sense, destroy markets, but thereby creating new markets. So existing products would go out of fashion because they were going to be replaced by newer products. Uh, one type of technology would go out and a new type of technology would come in. And this was what he called creative destruction. And this is what brought about economic growth. This is what brought about economic prosperity. So it was anti-equilibrium. It was the opposite to the equilibrium. And innovation had this power. But of course to bring about innovation requires entrepreneurship. The, the introduction of innovative techniques is a function of the entrepreneur. And the entrepreneur, him or herself, must be a leader. They must be able to inspire others to accept their ideas. They must be able to lead others by making good decisions and succeeding. So there's a linkage between entrepreneurship and leadership. There's also a linkage between entrepreneurship and innovation and a linkage between innovation and creative destruction, the destruction of markets. 
He described what he called the heroic entrepreneur, the single individual who brings about revolutionary change to his or her industry. The heroic entrepreneur is the, the person who stands out from the crowd, the individual who brings about a revolutionary change, a big change in the industry. So it could be the introduction of a new technology, it could be in the introduction of new ways of working or something innovative, but something which is big and radical and different, which of course will destroy the old markets and introduce a new market. But it'll also change the way people work. It'll change the way we see the world, in fact, the way we see products emerging, the way we accept new ways of working and new technologies. So the heroic entrepreneur is the, the person who makes the big radical change and perhaps changes an industry for all times. In leadership terms this translates to the, the person who has the ability to influence others and lead them to successfully bring about a vision. You see, entrepreneurship is about visions. It's about imagining. Imagining the future, imagining new ways of working, imagining new products. They don't exist, but the entrepreneur is imagining, is trying to understand the processes within the, the wider economy, looking at the way people work, looking at their aspirations, what they want, looking at existing technologies and what is possible and trying to put them together in an innovative way, a way which will enable the entrepreneur to make profit. So the entrepreneur is what uh, another famous economist, Israel Kersner, said. The entrepreneur is alert to profit potential. That's what drives the entrepreneur. The the profit potential out of the new idea. Of course it could be driven by uh, the desire to succeed, reputation and status, but by and large entrepreneurs are driven by the, the profit motive, trying to create a new product, trying to create a new way of working which will generate surplus, will generate a profit. So it, the leader which is part of the entrepreneur set of characteristics. The leader is, is one that must inspire others. They must be willing to follow that person. The person must have a good track record in predicting what the consumer wants. Uh, that person should be honest and decent, uh, should be trustworthy, um, should be hardworking, should be capable of bringing products and bringing processes to fruition, delivering what he or she says, in other words. So these ideas were adopted from Birkinshaw's work, Entrepreneurship uh, in the Global Firm, published by Sage. Now qualities are the traits approach. Well, when we talk about leadership, this is one approach that's often uh, put out. It, it revolves around the notion in psychology of, of whether we're determined by our nature or by our nurture. Nature is what is within us. This is the genetic makeup that we have and some people may be genetically predisposed to being good leaders. They're perhaps born to be good leaders. But other people may through experience and through perhaps education and through uh, a whole variety of events in throughout their lives have become good leaders. They have they've learned it. So this is the the nurture end. Now there's no answer to this one. We don't know what it is that makes people whether it is nature or nurture. It's a big debate. But the the traits approach to leadership assumes that leaders are born, that some people are born to be leaders. Now of course uh, this is highly speculative and many people will disagree. 
um, whether people have genetic makeups that enable them to become good leaders or not is highly disputable. But according to the traits approach, then people are. They're born to be leaders. Leaders leadership consists of certain inherited characteristics or personality traits. So the, the thesis is that leaders have certain characteristics and personality traits and these were, if you like, in genetically encoded. This is what was given to them uh, at birth. This is what, what they, they received from their, their parents and their grandparents and so on. So this is the, the traits approach to leadership. And of course if that's the case or if this is the case then we have a set of leaders who were born to be leaders and it's pointless for other people to try to be leaders because we haven't got the ability, we haven't been endowed with these qualities perhaps at birth. Highly contentious material this, very uh, very debatable and uh, it's, it's quite a strange view of, of uh, the world but um, it's one put forward in the literature and it's one that we should be familiar with. It focuses attention on the person in the job, not the job itself. So the traits approach looks at the leader in position, the, the, the leader who is, is working within the business, let's say, and leading the business and recognizing that that leader is there, in a sense, by right. They were born to be there. And, and therefore, in a sense, they should not be challenged. As I said, highly controversial, but um, this is the, the view of the trait approach. Now, there's also the functional or group approach to looking at leadership. Attention is focused on the functions and responsibilities of leadership, what the leader actually does and the nature of the group. So, in this view, it's more itemizing the functions that the leader must perform, the tasks that the leader must perform, and then recognizing that people who have the capabilities of performing those functions become leaders. So leadership is, is spotted. It's spotted through the ability of some people to be able to perform certain tasks. Because they can perform those tasks they become the leaders. Perhaps they're good administrators. Because they're good administrators uh, they become the leaders. Assumes leadership skills can be learned and developed. So a person who is good at a particular function, perhaps at administration, could then be trained to become the leader, the leader of a section within the business. And if they're successful at that, they could become a leader of a division within the business. And if they're successful there, they could become the leader of the business. So they are learning. They're learning by doing. They are being developed. So in this view, leaders emerge. Now as a behavioural category, leadership as a behavioural category, well, the kinds of behaviour of people in leadership positions and the influence on group performance. This is the essence of the behavioural category. It's, it's the kinds of behaviour that people in leadership positions uh, have, the, the kind of leadership style that they've got and how they influence group performance. Do they uh, coerce the group to act in certain ways? Do they lead the group to act in certain ways? Do they uh, incentivize the group to perform in certain ways? What is the management style? What's the leadership style? of the, the person. So how do they make the people working for them? 
their their subordinates in the context of let's say the company how did they get these people to work as a group and to work efficiently what what methods do they deploy do, do they set out to get the group to function appropriately so it draws attention to a range of possible managerial behaviors and the importance of leadership style it it's looking at the ways in which the leader operates uh, to get a set of results does the leader force the people coerce the people to behave in certain ways uh, is it a very strict regime where very close monitoring very very intense scrutiny all the time of the functions of uh, that's happening within the group and the performance of individual members of the group is there very close scrutiny of that or is the leadership style more trusting and set back from the group trying to support the group encourage the group or, or is it more interventionist Attention is focused on the functions and responsibilities of leadership, what the leader actually does and the nature of the group. So the functional uh, approach or the group approach looks at the functions of the, the leader. What does the leader do? How does the leader lead the group? What are the mechanisms that the, the leader uses to lead the group? Um, perhaps performance reviews, um, informal chats with the various members of the group, regular meetings, training sessions, uh, or perhaps the leader is more authoritarian and more controlling and forcing the, the group to act in a certain way. So the functional or group approach looks at the leader and tries to determine what style the leader uh, uses. It assumes, as I said, leadership can be learned and developed. The way in which functions uh, of leadership are carried out and the behaviour adopted by managers towards subordinate staff. Well, it's important that leadership be distinguished from other types of behaviour within the, the company leaders have particular obligations to perform particular tasks to uh, deliver certain services or products within the business so the leader has an obligation to fulfill the expectations of senior management let's say so leadership must work with the group and enable the group to function efficiently to deliver what's required of the group. Um, the styles of leadership are concerned with the effects of leadership on those being led. If the, the style of leadership is very interventionist and very controlling, the atmosphere may be bad and there may be a high turnover of labour. Workers may leave. Well, that's expensive because new workers will have to be found and recruited, and that's expensive, but also brought in and trained and acculturated to the way in which the business runs. So it's concerned with the style of leadership, and it assumes that leadership can be developed, and therefore there may be a onus on the organisation to have training programs for section leaders, departmental leaders, divisional leaders and so on to enable them to develop and see their own roles more clearly. The situational approach and contingency models well the importance of the situation is is more or less central to the whole notion of leadership. Where does the a leader find him or herself what's the situation what what are the tasks that need to be completed what are the obstacles what are the issues 
What's the situation? Interactions between the variables involved in the leadership situation and the patterns of behaviour. Uh, some organisations may have a long established culture, uh, perhaps a family business which has grown up from very small, um, a very small base to perhaps something much larger. But the, the culture of the business has still remained small and family orientated. So the workers are uh, find it easy, easy working there and uh, it's, it's a very supportive environment. But it may not be very efficient and perhaps later because of market pressures there's a need to be more efficient. Now the leader will have a problem in moving the the culture from one of moving along gently and and in a very happy sense to one which is much more dedicated to getting the job done, meeting deadlines and uh, improving the quality of the work and so it's much more harsh and leadership will be will be required to bring the group along uh, to ensure that the, the tasks can be met. Belief that there is no single style of leadership appropriate to all situations. Well the contingency model and the situational model recognizes that leadership must be dependent on the situation in which the leader finds him or herself. Um, the example I just gave with the family run business or it could be that they find themselves in a business which is uh, running at a very high speed with high levels of productivity and uh, a very dynamic and innovative workforce so it'll be a different style of leadership required so the leadership model is dependent upon the type of organization the type of product the, the rate of technical progress within the industry, um, the the recent history of the of the business, transformational leadership. Well, this type of leader engenders uh, motivation and commitment, creating a vision for transforming the performance of the organisation, and appealing to the higher ideals and values of followers. Transformational you know, leadership is is motivating and finding commitment amongst the workers to change, to to adopt new ways of working, to adopt new technologies, to innovate the product. They're transforming the business. It's transformational. But to do that, they must inspire the workers. They must inspire the staff to want this. They don't want to cause problems. They want to take the workforce with them. They must get the workforce to see the vision, see the advantages of the change and for the workforce to want that change to occur. So we've seen in this session that there are different types of leadership. We've also seen that leadership is in a sense a component of entrepreneurship. Uh, the entrepreneur must be able to articulate what he or, she's, he or she sees as the way forward, the type of process or the, the product that they envisage. They must be able to see that and then they must be able to lead others into seeing the same vision and supporting the ideals and working with them. So the argument in this particular session is that leadership is a part of entrepreneurship. But then leadership itself will be uh, contingent upon the situation it finds itself in. The leader will find him or herself in different situations and they'll be confronted by different problems and there'll be different styles of leadership required in different situations. There isn't one single style of leadership that's appropriate in all circumstances. So there are different, sty uh, different styles and these are linked to different situations. It's worth going back over these notes and making your own notes to identify different styles of leadership and uh, making brief notes on what they are and in what circumstances they may arise.
but that's all we're going to deal with for now so let's leave it at that and say thank you for watching